a noisy world, sometimes too noisy. The Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates that tens of thousands of employees suffer permanent hearing loss from being exposed to excessive noise on the job. To help combat the problem, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, created the Occupational Noise Exposure Standard to protect workers from noise hazards. In this program, we'll discuss the hazards of excessive noise, how they can affect us and what we can do to avoid them. We'll also examine several types of hearing protection that can help to safeguard your hearing on the job. To understand how to protect your hearing from hazardous noise, it helps to know a few things about how sound works. Sound is transmitted from its source to your ear by pressure waves moving through the air. How fast a sound's waves vibrate is called its frequency. Low frequency waves vibrate slowly, making low pitched sounds. High frequency waves vibrate quickly, making high pitched sounds. Frequency is measured in cycles per second or hertz. High pitched, high frequency sounds can be especially damaging to our hearing. The loudness of a sound is called its volume. The volume of a sound is measured in units known as decibels or dB. A sound's loudness can vary significantly depending on the environment you're in. The background noise in a typical home measures about 55 decibels. Music at a rock concert can reach 105 to 115 decibels. The jets on an airliner register about 140 decibels. How long a noise lasts is called its duration. This characteristic is used to define three types of sound, continuous, intermittent, and impulsive. Noise that goes on steadily with little or no change over time is called continuous noise. When loud sounds occur for significant lengths of time but are separated by relatively quiet pauses, the condition is called intermittent noise. Noise that lasts for less than a second but is very loud, such as when a punch press or stamping machine cycles, is called impulsive noise. All these types of sound can be hazardous, but noise that is loud and continuous is especially hazardous to your hearing. Our ears are designed to gather in the sounds around us and transmit them to our brains. The process of picking up and transmitting sound waves occurs in the outer, middle, and inner ear. The outer ear collects sound waves and funnels them down the ear canal toward a tight membrane called the eardrum. Sound waves that strike the eardrum cause it to vibrate so that it transmits them to three small bones in the middle ear. These bones amplify the sound and carry it to a structure in the inner ear called the cochlea. The cochlea is filled with fluid and contains thousands of hairs that are attached to nerve cells. When vibrations stir the hairs, the nerve cells send electrical signals to the brain, which interprets them as sound. But this system can be fragile. An overdose of noise can easily damage the hairs and nerve cells within the cochlea. To visualize how this happens, imagine a field of wheat. Light breezes blow through the stalks without doing any harm, but high winds can bend the stalks so far that they break. When this happens, the shafts don't bounce back, they're permanently broken. Hazardous noise can do the same thing to the hairs of the cochlea, and the result is permanent hearing loss. So it's very important to recognize noise hazards and understand how to protect yourself from them before they cause you any harm. You'd expect potentially harmful noise levels in workplaces such as factories, airports, and construction sites. 
but they also exist in restaurants, department stores, call centers, and offices. To safeguard all workers from these hazards, OSHA has established two important benchmarks. First, if the noise in a workplace reaches an average of 85 decibels over an eight-hour period, an employer must implement a hearing conservation program. Second, the program must ensure that employees are not exposed to average noise levels greater than 90 decibels over the course of a shift. The employer is also required to provide employees with appropriate hearing protection, hearing safety training, and free medical tests to monitor their hearing. To keep noise levels at or below the 90 dB limit, companies use a system of controls. Some of these are physical safety measures such as installing quieter equipment, isolating sources of noise from surrounding work areas, or putting up sound absorbing barriers. Administratively, work shifts can be adjusted to limit the amount of time employees spend in high noise areas. However, when measures like these can't reduce workplace noise to a safe level, workers will need to wear hearing protection. Several types of hearing protection are available. Each has its own advantages, disadvantages, and requirements for proper use and care. And they are all marked with a noise reduction rating, NRR, that indicates how much noise reduction they can provide. To determine how much noise reduction is required in a workplace, subtract OSHA's 90 decibel safety limit figure from the area's measured noise level. For example, for a workplace that averages 105 decibels of noise over eight hours, subtracting 90 leaves 15 decibels. But to really be safe, OSHA recommends that you double the difference for an extra margin of safety. So the hearing protection in our example would have to provide not just 15, but at least 30 decibels of noise reduction. If you work in a high noise area, make sure you know how much noise reduction is needed and how much your protective equipment can provide. As we've said, employers must supply employees with hearing protection that will reduce their noise exposure to safe levels. But you need to remember that this equipment will only protect you when you're wearing it. If hearing protection is uncomfortable or gets in your way, you might be tempted to take it off. But you should never remove your protection in a noise hazard area. So it has to fit right, and it can't interfere with the work you do. Several types of ear protection are available, including earmuffs, earplugs, and canal caps. Earmuffs generally consist of two cushion cups filled with sound dampening material mounted on a headband. Cap mounted earmuffs attach to safety helmets. They're used in places where conditions are such that both the head and the ears need to be protected. For best protection, the cups must make a secure seal against your head. Glasses, facial hair, or other PPE, such as a respirator, can sometimes interfere with a good fit. Muffs are popular because they're easy to use and can be worn with earplugs if additional protection is needed. And they aren't easy to lose or misplace and don't tend to irritate the ear or cause infections. But earmuffs are heavier than other types of hearing protection, can be bulky, especially in confined spaces, and may become uncomfortable in hot working conditions. As with all PPE, you should inspect earmuffs for wear and tear every time you get ready to use them. If you find problems, don't put them on. Remember, earmuffs can't take care of you if you don't take care of them. Dirt and skin oil can cause cup cushions to harden and crack. Keep them clean by washing with a mild detergent and scrubbing with a soft brush. And be sure to follow the maintenance directions of the equipment's manufacturer.
While earmuffs cover the outside of the ear to prevent hazardous noise from getting inside, ear plugs and canal caps block sound from inside the ear canal itself. Ear plugs are an especially convenient type of ear protection. They're small and lightweight. They are more comfortable to wear in hot working conditions than earmuffs. They don't interfere with other protective equipment such as respirators, and they're inexpensive, especially the disposable type. But earplugs also have disadvantages. They can easily be lost. They provide less protection against high noise levels than earmuffs. Putting them in and getting them out can sometimes be difficult, and some people find that they irritate their ear canals. To prevent ear infections, wash your hands before handling earplugs. Inspect them before you put them in. If you find torn flanges or other signs of wear, don't use them. Damaged plugs can't give you the protection you need. Reusable plugs should be cleaned regularly to prevent infection and ensure a proper fit. Wash them in a mild detergent, scrubbing gently with a toothbrush. After rinsing, let the plugs air dry and put them back in their container. Canal caps are essentially ear plugs attached to a headband. Like individual ear plugs, their plugs, known as pods, keep hazardous noise out by capping the entrance to the ear canal. The rigid band that they are mounted on makes them easier than individual plugs to put on and take off, which makes them more convenient to use when the noise you are exposed to is intermittent. But keep in mind that canal caps provide less noise reduction than either earmuffs or individual ear plugs. Another important element in an employer's hearing conservation program is conducting regular hearing tests for employees who work in high noise areas. These tests are conducted by healthcare professionals and provided to employees at no cost. The tests determine how loud sounds have to be for a person to hear them at various frequencies. The results are plotted on an audiogram providing a visual representation of the employee's hearing. The first test establishes a baseline of how well employees can hear before they start work in a high noise environment. As further tests are conducted, usually on a yearly basis, those results will be compared to the baseline to determine if any changes have occurred in the employee's hearing. If the testing shows a 10 decibel reduction in an employee's ability to hear sounds at frequencies of 2,000, 3,000, or 4,000 hertz, the employer is required to notify the employee. This type of change is called a standard threshold shift, or STS. If one is detected, further testing may be necessary. If the hearing loss is determined to be permanent and related to exposure to workplace noise, the employer will take whatever steps are necessary to prevent the employee's condition from getting worse. Having these hearing tests regularly can help to catch hearing problems early so they can be dealt with more effectively. So make sure you don't skip yours if you're scheduled for one. As we've seen, excessive noise levels in the workplace can create real hearing problems but they can be avoided through a combination of safe practices and appropriate protective equipment. Let's review. When noise in a work area reaches an average of 85 decibels over an eight hour period, employers are required to implement a hearing conservation program. The program's goal is to prevent employee hearing loss by reducing noise exposure to safe levels. Employees who work in high noise areas will be provided with appropriate hearing protection, safety training, and free hearing tests. Hearing protection must provide sufficient noise reduction for the conditions, fit correctly, and not interfere with the work that employees are doing. Now that you understand the regulations, procedures, and equipment that can protect your hearing from hazardous noise on the job, you can help ensure that you and your coworkers go home with your hearing intact at the end of every work day.